And if we keep going the way we're going, you might as well, you know, when a kid comes out, as soon as the kid's digestive system is, is mature enough, you might as well just put them on medication. <laughs> you know, just put them on medication. Why wait? Because that's going to be that's going to be the way it ends up. If you start somebody out on the wrong track, right? Uh, because they're on the wrong track down the road, there's going to be a lot of craziness and a lot of chaos and a lot of suffering because they're on the wrong road. They're not in life. They're in their head. They're not experiencing reality. They're experiencing what they think. And then they can't understand why things don't work. You know, when you really start to look at it, you can begin to see that it, this, is not, this is not that hard to get in terms of why things don't work. You can start to connect the dots and realize, of course they don't work. How could they work? It's impossible for them to work that way. On the other hand, when you realize the truth and when you come into contact with your true nature, it's just as true that this is obviously natural. This is obviously a workable situation. To be what I am is a workable situation. To be in the world, to be in life as life is, is a workable situation. And when you get to the point where you start to experience the truth of who you are and you experience the truth the way life is, all of a sudden, what starts to happen is what we call a, a, the flow, the flow, the natural state. Everything starts to work. Well, because it does work. There's no problem. There's just situations that occur, but they aren't problems because you're not relating to them like they shouldn't be happening. That's what we call a problem, with something that shouldn't be happening. An awake person knows that everything that's happening should be happening. I mean, isn't that obvious? <laughs> Everything, that happen, everything that's happening should be happening. If you just make that one correction, you'll stop suffering. You'll stop suffering because you'll realize no matter what it is, no matter what it is, if death happens, you won't get upset because that's what should be happening. If you have emotions and you experience fear, that's not a problem. That's what should be happening, right? And also what should be happening is that you as a personality should be dysfunctional. Now listen. Also, what should be happening is you as a personality should be dysfunctional and should be suffering. Well, why should that be happening? Because if that doesn't happen, you won't wake up. If that doesn't happen, you'll, you'll, you'll just continue to suffer, which most human beings do, right? But they have wonderful stories about it, right? They have wonderful stories that explain it, that explain it. And the explanation for the suffering is a, an explanation in which the cause of the suffering is not me. That's the explanation. The cause of the suffering is you. The cause of the suffering is life. The cause of the suffering is politics. It's money. It's sex. It's drugs. It's rock and roll, right? Everything but me. Everything but me. And somebody who's completely identified with the personality, that's exactly the way they see, they see things. That's why the, the person who just announced the presidency said, anybody that I support that ran, that wins, they ran because of me. Anybody that loses, I had nothing to do with it. That's a pure personality, right? Isn't that the way personalities exist in the world, right? Is that they're self-centered. They're self-centered. And they, they, everything is seen from my view, from my view. And everything is seen in terms of how it's going to affect me. And so my life is about controlling you, controlling time, controlling money, controlling my life, controlling my body even though that doesn't work at all and creates more suffering and causes your body to die earlier, even though that doesn't work at all, but we all can continue to do that because we believe it's true and we believe it's right. And we just have to hope that there's a cure for cancer. The only thing, like Paul Hederman says, the only thing that can be said realistically about all the experiences you have as a personality is that they failed. That's the, only, that's the only thing to be taken away from it, that realistic and true, that, that it's failed to do that. And although it is true that there's no way to avoid the conditioning, there's no way to avoid the fact that you will lose your identity when you're born, you have to. You have to get a name, you have to get a personality, you have to believe you're this body, you have to believe space is real and time is real, so you could be in life. That's necessary. But it's not necessary for it to end there. Right? It's not necessary for it, to, for it to end there. You can go directly from there, for example, if you were a Tibetan Buddhist child and you were born in Tibet when the Tibetan, uh, the, the, the Tibetan that was the center of the Tibetan Buddhist uh, teachings and tradition, right? 
Yeah, you would be given a name. The Dalai Lama was given a name. You would be, uh, you would be given the understanding of your personality. And then right after that, you would be told, but that's not the truth. Right after that, you would be told that's not the truth. And so you wouldn't be practicing a lie for so long. And you would, so the Dalai Lama know, knew when he was very young what the truth was, right? So he can speak from there, he can talk from there. So that's why when somebody said to him, well, you've been around 88 years now, you know, when you look back at your life, all the things that happened, you know, what would you say was the, was the, the, the most precious time in your life, the, most, the moment that you consider to be the best time in your life? And he said, right now. That's the obvious answer if you're awake, right? The person asking him was thinking that they were talking to a personality because personalities would fall into the trap and say, oh, let me think, what was the best? Because personalities do comparing, right? No. But the awake state doesn't do comparing, it's just here. That's all, it's just here. There's nothing to compare anything with, it's just this. Yeah, but the reason I wrote that book is because for me, that's the, that is the key right there. If you can get clear that this idea that your personality is not true, if you can get clear that the conditioning that you went through that had you believe you were a physical body and a personality is not true, if you can just entertain that possibility and then start to look at the evidence, because the evidence is 100% for the truth, 100% for the truth. The evidence, for example, that you're not the voice in your head, is a, the evidence is 100% for the truth. What does that mean? Well, if you stop and take a look at the voice in your head, right, do you know what you think without listening to the voice? Do you know what you think without listening to the voice? No, you don't. Yeah. So what you think has already occurred and you didn't do it because you, if you did it, you wouldn't have to look to see what it is to know what you think. But you didn't do it, right? You have to look to see what's already happened in thought and then you say, oh, that was me. That's how the personality maintains its existence. It takes every, now watch, this is very important. Because self-inquiry, Ramana Maharshi was one of the most famous teachers of our time about waking up and discovering the, your true nature. And what he said is all you have to practice is self-inquiry. What is self-inquiry? It means start paying attention and start noticing everything that's happening in your life, right? It happens, right? And then the voice in your head, well, it doesn't even have to say it anymore because it's so, it's, it's so conditioned, right? That what's happening is happening and it's happening to me. What me? Where, where is this me that everything is happening to, right? Well, it's happening in thinking, right? I, I think that I do. I think that things happen to me, right? I'm just making up shit, that's all. But everybody's making up the same shit, so we all believe it, <laughs> right? And then it makes us crazy, and we act crazy, right? And then we have to find some explanation for that because we really don't understand what the hell's going on at all. Yeah, it's obvious. That's what I mean by the evidence. The evidence is pretty clear. Yeah, if what you were thinking wasn't just what you were thinking, but it was actually what you could observe that everybody else is seeing, then we'd all be thinking the same thing. But none of us are thinking the same thing. We're all thinking different things, right? So all of the conditioning is, is taking what's coming in, processing it, and turning into your, supposedly your individual perception as a person, right? But it's not, it's just your brain. It's just your brain. And the proof that it's just your brain is you can practice on doing it by paying attention to it doing what it's doing, knowing that that's not true. And by paying attention that way, it starts to unwind it, starts to unravel it. So you can, come, you can decondition and recondition your brain. They call that now neuro-enlightenment, neuro-enlightenment. And by being receptive and open and being open to what's beyond what you think, what's beyond what you think you know, you might get a download of the truth, right? And then you may have a wake up, then you may have a realization experience. But if you wanna have that be consistent, the first thing you have to do is understand that the thinking will come back, you will go back into the illusion, you will go back into the dream, you will go back into being a personality, right? But that doesn't mean that you are that. You can know the truth and play the game. You, you have to play the game, really, and you can know the truth. And if you know the truth, even if you're not experiencing being that awareness at the moment, right, you can know that it's true and therefore you don't trust what's playing. So you can know the truth, therefore you stop trusting what's happening and you start paying attention to what's happening because you know you can't count on that.
That's what, that's what keeps getting you into trouble. So you practice meditation to keep relaxing the body and calming the mind, why? So you can be more available to see what's going on because you have to pay attention to what's going on because most of the time it's off the track. Most of the time it's not consistent with reality. And if you're paying attention that way, you can start making corrections. You can stop believing your thoughts. You can stop believing your emotional reactions. You can start paying attention to what's really happening, not your interpretation of it, and you can start to act consistent with what you're seeing instead of what you're thinking. Everything in life is unstable, including your personality, including your thought process, including what's happening. Isn't it all changing all the time? Yeah, that's what they say in Buddhism. That's called impermanence. It's changing all the time, right? And so that's a source of suffering because you can never, ever get, get anything to stay still. You know, that's why people get married. They think it's going to control what's going to happen next. <laughs> Good luck with that. Satisfaction is the experience of being present to everything the way it is, right? With no resistance, with no uh, efforting, with no struggling. Being present to everything the way it is. And when you're present to everything the way it is, you're, you're moving with you know, it. What it is, is a state of well-being. And that's why Richie Davidson, and if you're interested in meditation, you should get the book, uh, uh, Altered Traits by Dr. Richie Davidson. He's a, a neuroscientist, right? It'll really tell you how the research on the brain has proven without any question at all that you can change the brain because the brain is changing all the time. And if you know how to do that, you can hack your own brain and start to reprogram your own brain. And therefore, what he said is, well-being is a practice. Well-being is a practice. You can practice living a way that will allow well-being to begin the experience, begin the, to begin the experience that you're having, begin to be the experience that you're having. But it's not free lunch. It requires starting somewhere and doing something consistently that is consistent with the truth, which meditation is. And then the other part of it is to go back to school, right? You started in kindergarten learning a, a day by day, piece by piece, by piece, you learned all of the things that we consider to be true, none of which are. So now you have to go back and go through another learning process. And this is a learning process that's based on spiritual truth, that's based on actual truth. And as you learn that process, and this is there for you to learn, you can, you can study the Buddhist text, you can, you can study there's many truth texts that exist that come from the mystical uh, area, come from the mystical understanding of reality. So it's there to learn. And it's important to learn, it's important to develop understandings because as you develop understandings, you're learning about the real world. You're learning about the truth. You're learning about how things really are, right? So you have some reference point for it and then you're practicing to see what you're learning about. And you can see what you're learning about when you practice meditation and you learn about the truth. But when you learn about what's not true, you can't see it because it doesn't exist. The only place that ever exists is in your head. That's why, you know, people are so crazy when they live in their head. <laughs>